Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are in the world, or good evening, evening. And it's a pleasure to be here with all of you today at the Horasis Asia meeting. I always uh, enjoy doing these Horasis meetings because the, the good part about it is all of us from different parts of the world come together to talk about problems which are sometimes global, but also sometimes specific to a certain region. And I have always been uh, in a huge fan of the format of the Horasis events. Uh, and I'm, I'm glad that you know, Frank and his team are keeping it going uh, in the virtual format. And that is also thanks to all the wonderful speakers and also the audience who have uh, you know, continued to show deep interest. So welcome to this session. Uh, we are going to be talking, as you know, uh, our topic to be precise is developing social innovation and enterprise. We are primarily going to be talking about social innovation, which is a very, very uh, important topic. And uh, we are also going to be talking about the interplay between how enterprises can and have been, uh, you know, playing a role towards uh, contributing to social innovation. Now, uh, before I, you know, introduce the topic very briefly, I'm going to spend, you know, one minute talking about myself. I am Vijay Sambamurthy. Uh, I will be chairing this panel, and uh, uh, I am the founder and managing partner of Lexogen, uh, which is a leading law firm in India with offices in Singapore. Uh, we do a lot of, um, you know, good work in the areas of private equity, venture capital, mergers and acquisitions, technology regulatory, infrastructure projects, and so on. And I personally am a transactional lawyer with about 24 plus years of experience. Uh, I have uh, done a lot of, you know, advisory work for clients ranging from governments to, you know, multinational corporations to private equity funds to venture capital funds to startups that are still, you know, in the growth mode. So uh, that is my brief background. Uh, and apart from my lawyer hat, the other thing that I do is mentor a lot of startups uh, you know, uh, in India, in the Southeast Asian region, and also sometimes in the U.S. So let me just quickly talk about the topic we are here to discuss today and why it's important. Social innovation, what is social innovation? I mean, we can all go into our own uh, definitional, uh, you know, exercises over there. But the way I see it, social innovation is quite simply utilizing an innovative mindset or an innovative approach to uh, achieve positive societal outcomes. And uh, there could be any kind of outcomes. Some of them could be really small. Some of them could be, you know, transformational. Uh, and the more important thing is that why we are talking about social innovation is that uh, historically speaking, it, it used to be largely the realm of government and the state. Historically, most social innovation and most social matters, as we know, was largely determined and driven by the state. And it was considered the responsibility of the state to deliver social progress. And therefore, if, if there was any innovation required to achieve that progress, it therefore stood to reason that it was the responsibility of the state. Now, as we all know, that has been changing, that kind of a thought process has been changing a lot over the past several decades, whereby uh, in addition to the state, uh, a lot of the significant progress and a lot of the significant social innovation has actually come, come from private enterprise. I'm not saying that governments have not innovated. There are huge examples of fantastic government innovation. Singapore is an example I always like to talk about because uh, that's, that's one uh, society where the government uh, of the state is always innovating and, uh, you know, not just, you know, from an economic or a scientific perspective, but even from a social perspective, it's, it's always been on the cutting edge of innovation. And there are similarly other states that I could cite as examples where, uh, you know, the government, uh, including including India, I mean, we, we, the Indian government gets often uh, beaten up on a regular basis for doing a lot of things wrong. But I have to say, we also do a lot of uh, things right. I mean, the government also does a lot of things right. But having said that, it is an undisputed fact that over the last several decades, the cornerstone of innovation, the true innovation or the true measure of innovation has been driven 
uh, in my view at least, by the private sector or the private enterprise. Of course, we have a panel here, and, and I'd love to get their views on what they think about it, whether they agree with me or not. But this is my view, that a large fee, uh, you know, the social innovation aspect has been driven by private sector. Now, what is it that the private sector can do? I mean, is very often I see when even governments or even uh, companies talk about innovation, there is this tendency to think about innovation through the prism of scientific research and development or technology and so on. Now, of course, those are important innovations. You know, science and technology do contribute a lot to have contributed and will contribute a lot to human progress. So undoubtedly, they are important. But I'm sure all of us agree those are not the only kind of social innovations that can be at play. In fact, I would say many of the social innovations are, that are very important relate to matters of policy, relate to matters of process. Sometimes these, you know, uh, are well thought out uh, or just a simple, uh, you know, social innovation in the form of a policy or a process can be so huge and powerful that it can deliver transformational outcomes. Now, with the COVID pandemic, it has become even more important to think in terms of social innovation because the whole world has been disrupted. We've all heard the terms. I mean, you know, it is like a black swan event. Uh, but the world uh, has suffered and the world is now recovering. And governments and private enterprise alike have responded with a lot of innovation. And in these times, when we are just beginning to emerge, hopefully, from the pandemic and going into the next stage of recovery, it is very important to talk about what enterprises and government should be thinking of or how should be, uh, what sort of social innovation measures they should be contemplating. And to do that and to have that discussion, I have a stellar panel here, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you. So firstly, there is Suman Bose. Suman is uh, based in Singapore. He's the principal co-founder of GoFAR Advisory and Investments. Uh, you know, GoFAR has a lot of deep operating experience and rich diversity. And they work and partner with visionary founders to build companies uh, of global scale. So they've been doing a lot of good work uh, in, in, you know, in this ecosystem. And apart from this, Suman is also the co-founder of Secure Food. Uh, it's an integrated agri-foods uh, fulfillment ecosystem, which is powered by you know, AIML. And uh, it's aimed at addressing the larger problem of uh, global food security value chain. So welcome to the panel, Suman. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Inkem Kumba, who's a lecturer and member of the STEM Africa Initiative of the University of Michigan in the United States. He's had a long career in academia, research and consulting. Uh, in fact, uh, he and I have had the pleasure of speaking at a couple of other Horasis events as well. Uh, and I know that his inputs are always very valuable. Nkem regularly advises, uh, you know, numerous international organizations, uh, including the African Union. He's, uh, he advises uh, some African governments. Uh, he also advises several UN programs on a, on, a, on a range of issues. In addition to that, Nkem is an avid ambassador of scientific capacity and human development. And he has a lot of published articles in several reputable journals, like the New York Times and the African Policy Review. Welcome again, uh, Nkem. Good to have you back on a panel with me. Next up, we have Tris Dyson. Uh, Tris is the managing director of Nesta Challenges. Uh, you know, it's a it's a company that he set up, organization that he set up in 2012. Uh, you know, Tris is based in London. And Nesta Challenges, you know, designs and runs challenges, you know, they run, cha you know, challenge prizes to, uh, you know, fund or to reward those who are seeking to solve problems that have not been solved till now easily. So well, that's a wonderful initiative in my view, because one of the best ways to innovate is to fund and back innovation. And, uh, you know, I think uh, Nesta is doing, Nesta Challenges are doing some great work there in identifying and rewarding people who are coming up with fantastic uh, innovations around the world. So uh, welcome. To the uh, welcome to the panel as well, Tris. 
And and lastly, uh, I'm not sure if uh, Daraz is going to be able to join us. I don't think so. Uh, but I'll quick, uh, quickly talk about two other panelists who are supposed to be here with us, but I don't think they're going to be able to. Uh, one was uh, Rufus. Uh, you know, Rufus is in the EdTech space. He runs an EdTech company in Sweden. And uh, he unfortunately couldn't join us today because uh, he was summoned for military service. And, uh, you know, Suman, I thought Singapore and Israel were the only countries in the world that were, you know, enforcing compulsory military service. I was, so this was, a, this was a bit of trivia for me. This is something I wasn't aware of. Uh, and similarly, we, have, um, we, have, we were supposed to have another panelist who was Darius, who was uh, a very interesting person again. He, like me, is a business lawyer with a lot of experience based in Poland. But in addition to, uh, you know, his legal practice, he also runs a business uh, which is in the aviation advisory and training space, which is very fascinating for me. That's a lot of uh, stuff that he has on his plate, which probably uh, explains why he couldn't make it. <laughs> but with that, let's get uh, rolling. Um, are you all ready for the discussion? Okay, wonderful. So the way we're going to structure this, ladies and gentlemen, is... Uh, we're going to throw questions to the panel. Uh, I'm going to have one generic question, uh, which I will ask to everybody. And then I have some specific questions uh, for each of them. Uh, so the first generic question I have is, while you know, social innovation has always been a very important issue, as I just mentioned, the COVID pandemic has reinforced its importance even more. And now as the world starts to re-emerge from this and to think of strategies for, you know, sustainable and safe recoveries, how do you see countries and private enterprises approaching social innovation? What, what have you seen in your experience and what do you think uh, they're doing right? I mean, of course, we have a time constraint. So uh, now with two panelists backing out, each of you can get a little more, but uh, it would be great if each of you could keep your answers to about four to five minutes uh, so that we can go to the specific questions and also have some time for the audience questions, if any. So uh, may I request Suman, you to weigh in first on this one. Sure. Uh, for the introduction. Uh, uh, you know, pandemic is uh, obviously uh, uh, in a many way a reset button, but I think a lot of us felt that the button was coming for a long time. Uh, if you see uh, joblessness was on a rise uh, across the world uh, and, you know, human purpose of uh, work that gives people identity. I mean, you know, I had a, I had a uh, understanding when my dad told me that the, the two questions that most commonly spoken in the, have been asked in the world is what's your name and what do you do? Uh, no one asks you who are you born to unless you are talking to a toddler. So what is your name and what do you do? If the what do you do has been vanishing for a long time and, and the pandemic has just accelerated it. Uh, I think the social concerns and the buttons to press the social concern was always there. Uh, pandemic has just made it uh, very apparent because uh, you know the, all, the, all the social measures, whether it is global hunger, whether it is uh, job, uh, joblessness or whatever, you know, this has all been on the rise. Uh, but we also saw some very nice fruitful innovation emerging during the pandemic. And thanks to uh, the way the world has learned how to network, uh, you know, a conference like this is, a, is an example of that. So, so there are pluses that has happened. A lot of, uh, you know, sirens have gone forth or bugles have been blown to say, hey, you know, there's, there's an emphasis on the climate. So, so if I put it all together, I think this is a... Uh, a moment of uh, it, you can you can consider this to be a perfect opportunity or a perfect storm. Uh, uh, why I say this because uh, the jury is yet out whether innovation is outpacing the destruction. Uh, as much as we would love to see, uh, love to say that you know here we are funding all this innovation stuff, but for example, I know for sure a lot of businesses are turning back and saying, hey, you know what? My concern for uh, uh, environment. I mean, let's notch it down a little bit because uh, I'm in an existential crisis. Let me save myself and then I think rethink about my stance that I had taken on no plastic or zero plastic or what low plastic. So, uh, so it's it's a it's a delicate balance that the world is at this point of time, and this is the best time when I think the best of the people in the world must must 
come together. And this is a call for action to do innovation, frugal innovation, innovation at which can which can be uh, turned. You know, we can you can extract the global piece and you can make hyper local uh, applications that goes across the uh, across the world. And I can I can for sure see you know Singapore, for example, taking a very important position over here because Singapore wants to be uh, the, because of its small size and the small population. Singapore wants to be uh, literally at that uh, you know that connector between uh, the the do's that has to happen in the world with hyperlocal uh, implementation and uh, the the thinking process or the funding process that might must come together. So these three things of uh, of uh, innovation of uh, Innovative funding structures and uh, you know uh, legal and IP rights that protects innovation and ensures that that innovation uh, draws a lot of uh, you know incentive for people to participate. I think that's that's in my view is the emerging model of social innovation going forward. Uh, the, those those very long drawn out large scale large intervention projects might take a backseat. Just like the the technology world is seeing, uh, you know, the waterfall model giving giving way to the Scrum model of doing work or the agile model of doing work, I think social innovation also has to be an agile model. If you don't see that in the in a, in a quarter or two quarters, some perceptible change, uh, you know, people may not have the interest to either fund it or interest to get engaged in, and absorbed into it. And the voluntary services will not be good enough to pull and pull the heft of what is needed to be done in the world. So that those are my opening comments, and back to you, Vijay. Thank you, Suman. That was, um, you know, those were some very wonderful opening insights. Uh, yes, absolutely. The takeaway is that uh, you know it may be the perfect storm, but it also presents a perfect opportunity to rethink things uh, the way that we are done, and not just the small things, but even some really big things. Um, and 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 I agree with you. There is a lot of innovation with some of it very frugally done which is uh, making a big difference so thank you for that suman with that i'll uh, throw the same question to Nkan. yes uh, hi. Uh, good afternoon friends and uh, let me first start by thanking uh, frank for inviting me back again and uh, for maintaining uh, the stellar program that is uh, been running for asia and for other parts of the world and the global global uh, for a few years now, it's, 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 it's a wonderful platform, and it's good to meet uh, all three of you at least, uh, and, and you again, DJ. My internet is a little intermittent here, so I'm sorry if uh, it goes a bit on and off, but uh, I'll be with you. So in terms of uh, social uh, innovation and the uh, pandemic and post-pandemic world, uh, I have worked mostly with, uh, with, with Africa um, across the board, and uh, I uh, the thing that uh, you said earlier, DJ, they, they capture much of what I am observing on the, on the continent. Um, Africa happens to be one that the unique um, part of the world where most of the countries are just recently uh, post-colonial. And the government is, has played a very dominant role in society. The public sector has dominated uh, the, um, the, the employment sector for a long, long time. It's highly industrialized, um, uh, highly... Uh, um, a, a large informal economy across the continent. But uh, when, when the pandemic came in, you know, um, um, many governments too could not respond immediately the way they would normally respond and prescribe things top bottom in, in a straight jacketed way. So you've seen, uh, I have seen uh, lots of uh, innovative uh, solutions and thought processes, uh, some, some kind of a shift from the norm of the public sector to a stronger role for young folks and, uh, and small and medium-sized companies that have stepped up to provide the alternatives that, that the governments couldn't, uh, couldn't um, um, uh, provide. And, uh, when, when you combine that with the, uh, with the savvy, tech-savvy young folks on the continent who are able now to manipulate lots of the high-tech stuff, much more than government institutions, then uh, the pandemic, has, I think, why about macroeconomic, macro budgetary, macro uh, human capital issues. At the sub macro level, the micro level, I, I see a sea change towards the um, society being empowered a little bit more uh, to do for itself what normally it would be for the government to do. 
Many of the solutions on the continent came from just regular folks trying to find answers to it, and then heavy government um, um, in the process. Uh, last, uh, last I checked, uh, in Nigeria alone, by mid this year, there were over 192 innovations to address just healthcare issues around the pandemic. So the whole healthcare industry is being uh, uh, is being strengthened, and a lot of these innovations coming mostly from the uh, private sector. This has implications on society and social norms. And as uh, my previous colleague was saying, you know, what's your name? What do you do? Now many people have questions for what do they do? They uh, they step up to uh, contribute uh, to to uh, to uh, responses to societal problems. So I think. Uh, you know, big reports, UN reports, World Bank reports, government reports, big policy reports might indicate certain macro data, but the pandemic has really empowered the uh, the regular African university, university graduate, especially even the regular person in the market, to be really more savvy, to to be more creative in how uh, they, they do business and how they contribute to just taking ownership of problems that are around them. No one could address the pandemic at the most local level, but the regular folks step up and do it. Regular community associations where people socialize and uh, spend time on weekends. You know, when they were locked down, they had to come up with ways to go about doing their businesses uh, or still living their lives. So uh, at, at that level, I see lots of good stuff. Now at the macro level, you know, when you combine, uh, uh, when, when you add uh, the various innovations, FinTech now, uh, e-commerce, uh, digital currencies, uh, they are being adopted more and more by African countries. Nigeria, Togo, they just uh, adopted, uh, the central banks recently adopted um, um, uh, e-currencies, right? So those things would not have been there previously, at least not so quickly, had the uh, pandemic not forced, not forced the shift towards a digital society. So, uh, I think on, on the long run is is bordered well for human empowerment for people stepping up to or take ownership of their own environment and in that way applying their own brain capacity their own know how their own innovations to address uh, their people and that's exactly what the African continent has been trying to do for a long time but being straight jacketed by uh, by dominant governments all all powerful heads of state all powerful ministers now the regular folks are stepping up and they're helping those leaders address issues that uh, are pertinent to to, uh, to their lives. So I think uh, it, it's been very good, at least on, on, the, on the Africa side. Wonderful, wonderful insights, and come. thank you for that. Certainly, uh, I think the important uh, aspect to know from your, what you said is that uh, th there's a shift in ownership. I mean, I started this session by talking about how there was a shift from government to private enterprise. But what you're talking about is even more interesting because it's not even about private enterprise, it's local communities taking ownership for their own, you know, solving their own problems. And I agree with you very often in, in, in uh, continents like Africa, that is probably the best way to solve the problems when, uh, you know, you take ownership for your community. So I'm going to come back to you with more questions on Africa because you're obviously the Africa expert on this. Uh, so your second question is going to be on that. I'm just giving you some uh, advance notice. Uh, but before that, I want to, uh, you know, get uh, Tris Dyson's uh, perspective on the first question as well. Tris. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Um, uh, very interesting to hear uh, Suman and Kem's um, opening uh, points. And I think I, I would agree with, with everything that's been said so far. Um, certainly the pandemic has exacerbated challenges. Sir Cam's point about the storm, um, it's greatly exaggerated problems of inequality and access to opportunity within countries, between countries and so on. It's, it's accelerated trends that are already happening. Um, I think it's very true to Enkem's point that there's been a remarkable amount of sort of grassroots social innovation in response to that. Um, and we've seen particularly addressing issues of financial resilience, 
um, and helping people um, get back on their feet. Um, and I think it's certainly true that social entrepreneurs and innovators are much more empowered and in a strong position to respond, particularly at a local level, to some of these challenges. Um, and I suppose I think what's needed then is, is two things. Firstly, um, governments need to now lean in and help that to happen more. Um, so, you know, innovation comes from everywhere. Um, and governments are, and um, in terms of enablers of innovation, um, are quite poor at stimulating and encouraging that um, from a grassroots perspective. They're much better at funding big top-down projects. Um, so that's something that that we need governments to to do. Um, and I think the other thing is that there's lots of promising grassroots social innovation around the world, but really we need it to scale um, to meet some of these very significant challenges around social inequality, poverty, climate change, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, that is going to involve private sectors to some extent, but governments really to help with that scaling of really impactful social innovation. And we think that means that they need to change the, the, the way that they deliver innovation funding away from funding top-down input-based grant funding type approaches to an outcome-based models where funding is based on tangible deliverable social impact and innovation on the ground and there's some reason for optimism because we've seen that governments these sort of big lumbering elephants have learned to move fast as a consequence of the pandemic so let's hope that they maintain that um, speed as we move, hopefully, anyway, into a post-pandemic response. Thanks, thanks, Tris. Those were fascinating and quite inconsistent, quite consistent with what we've all talked about. Uh, but yes, I mean, uh, one a quick rejoinder or a quick, uh, not a rejoinder, but a quick addition to what you said is that I agree with you completely that you know government. Uh, historically has approached these problems by looking at how can we fund this and how can we fund that. And I think very often uh, that is a wrong way to approach a problem. I think the government can do more actually by facilitating more grassroots uh, level, um, you know, uh, movements or grassroots level uh, initiatives. That's number one. And secondly, the government can do more by, uh, you know, uh, progressive policy making. I think the power of government to make policies that can you know, result in transformational social innovation is unmatched, right? So the government should use that power worldwide. Governments worldwide should use that power. Uh, so I think I agree with you uh, that funding is not the way to go. They should use their power to, you know, make a difference other ways and to enable and empower more grassroots level activities. Absolutely. So uh, with that, I'm just going to take off to the uh, second question, the uh, second set of questions, which are more specific to each of you. Uh, but uh, those were all fascinating insights to the first one. Uh, I think, uh, thank you all for that. So income, I'm coming back to you. Uh, you know, when it comes to, you know, innovation of any kind, um, Africa has to be right up there, right? Uh, I mean, Asia used to be there, but now the next big opportunity undoubtedly is, uh, Africa, Asia is still a, uh, you know, very fast emerging opportunity, but really where the next, uh, where the next billion people are is probably in Africa, right? So what I wanted to ask you is as somebody who's worked with a lot of African governments and with, uh, you know, multi multilateral organizations in the, in the region, advising on the region, I wanted to get your sense of how 
um, you know, because of the pandemic, I know you talked about how the grassroots level uh, movements have started up and how the communities are owning responsibility. But how have governments in particular uh, and, you know, enterprises, both local enterprises and multinationals operating in the region, how have they respond, responded to the pandemic? And do you see them, uh, you know, already implementing or planning to implement any huge social innovation uh, measures or approaches? Well, so I'm sorry. I think I think I heard you. But I'm not so sure because my internet was very uh, was intermittent. But uh, I think I have a gist of what of what you're asking. Uh, so well, let, let, let me let me preview it this way. First, Africa is the large continent of about 54 or so countries that are now. So uh, it's hard to lump them all as uh, governments are doing this. The governments are doing that. But there are some specific cases that we may look at uh, the their ability to respond or not respond to whatever challenges they face uh, vary from their country's capacities, the, you know, their, their human capital. So uh, you have some countries that are doing very well at the cutting edge. They are the forefront of setting the tone for the rest of, the, uh, of, of their peers. And there are some that are following those who are, who, who are doing well. So you have countries like Ghana. Ghana is a key case. Um, uh, Nigeria, the, the big powerhouses, especially the English-speaking countries on the continent, like Kenya. They are, and, and South Africa, of course, is always there. It's a uh, advance. And then you have uh, Senegal um, and, and countries like Cameroon and, um, and, 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 and Cote d'Ivoire. They have been the ones that have responded very well. But uh, so the one thing that has come up, out of this and, and, and helped the government is the, the growth of the public sector, uh, of the public policy industry. You know, uh, most public policies have always come from government offices. But now you have lots of voices inputting into the public policy discourse, both from journalists, from social media outlets that are also enhanced by the pandemic since the digital systems have become dominant and people were home and uh, the, the, the social distancing may, may not they turn to, uh, to, to media for, for, for information. And just think tanks that are flourished to address uh, the, the pandemic. So. Um, uh, in that light, many of much of what the, the governments have responded mostly uh, on, 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 uh, with two inputs. One is uh, the national committee that always comes around to, to support uh, the government effort. You know, where where the the, uh, the, uh, the the continent wasn't in position to produce vaccines yet. Now they are trying, they are working on producing their own vaccines. But prior to that, you know, that they get support from say the U.S., uh, Russia, or or. or, or, or Who study macroeconomics and advise governments on what to do? Those the, those have been there, but there's been a, a flourishing in the middle of, for, for domestically of uh, public policy discourses around healthcare, linking that to energy, linking that to quality of life, and all the plethora of things that people on the continent have always complained about, but government could not respond to. So there's been that mindset um, um, uh, shift towards uh, those, those the uh, people uh, being able to uh, do their own things. So uh, earlier on, um, uh, there's, there's uh, the Institute Pasteur, I think out of um, uh, Senegal, that uh, was at the forefront of uh, helping the Senegalese government and through them, most West African governments um, um, addressed uh, the pandemic. The Africa CDC, so incidentally, just before the pandemic uh, arose, the U.S. Center for Disease Control had, uh, on, on request from the African Union, helped establish an African CDC that was headed by an African who had been working at the, at the U.S. CDC. And they helped uh, and they worked very hard in organizing the, the African governments. Uh, I think at that time, uh, when it started up last year, President Siri Ramaphosa of South Africa was the African Union president. So he was the one now charged with leading an African continental response, organizing his peer presidents and heads of states to have a continental uh, approach to it. Uh, as I mentioned, many of the things, individual countries cannot handle them. Capacity, infrastructure, you know, it's very challenging. When I say capacity, I mean human capital, the competencies, uh, the, you know, and, and the and infrastructure and the, and the budgetary uh, requirements sometimes. One, the, so that, that's to go by, through uh, regional approaches. And the most regional is continental, and Ramaphosa was helping with that. Uh, so uh, they were very uh, good at um, I think in, uh, with the support of UNECA, 
These are the continental bodies that address things at the continental level. United Nations Economic Commission of Africa. So they, 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 I think in my mind, they, they were extremely good and brilliant at how, uh, at how they crafted continental policy discourses and continental policy responses that others adopted uh, as, uh, as, uh, as one group. It so happens that the, the pandemic also came in when uh, the African continent itself was veering towards a continental free trade area to try to become one free market. So the, uh, and, uh, they've been working towards uh, ratifying trade treaties that give them one, one, uh, one uh, bargaining block in the global market. So uh, the UNECA especially that have been supporting this were, was very good at uh, latching the pandemic response to the continental agenda so that it, is, it strengthened Africa's integration, Africa's ability to work with, uh, with uh, the countries working with each other to respond to, to common challenges and integrate their economies. So many, some so, so of the you know, innovations in one country were quickly adopted by our countries. Uh, uh, in the spirit of that, in, uh, of that uh, integration, uh, some of the losses uh, that some countries uh, incurred in terms of budgetary and tax revenues were, were, were very painful and slowed down uh, much of their progress. But overall, uh, how did Africa respond? I think Africa, is, I think Africa responded as good as anybody in their position could have responded. Uh, now, when the continent is uh, strengthening its uh, research academic labs in biomedical sciences, that otherwise maybe the impetus for that would, would, would not be strong. Now they're looking at producing vaccines on the continent. Well, vaccine for for the COVID might not now make some or for the next pandemic or for whatever healthcare challenges they have. So. The response to this uh, pandemic might enable them be, 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 be in better position to respond to future challenges in all sectors. So, like we've seen in the Western countries, academic uh, programs, uh, research labs, they don't respond to one event. They respond to things that arise in society over time from various domains. The, the innovation comes out of research lab patenting and uh, patented uh, you know, products uh, that are commercializable. They come out of research labs. So uh, at, the, at the higher end level, the university system that, that was uh, forced to go online without infrastructure, uh, competitive compared to the Western countries, there the were innovations where government now came in and uh, worked or forced telecoms, the dominant telecommunications uh, enterprises, Orange, uh-huh. FTN, to now provide bandwidth that otherwise they would uh, provide a market value. To go with the private sector in a very innovative way to, to enable uh, society withstand what otherwise they would not have been able to do. So, uh, lots of innovations came out of it. It's hard to share all those in, uh, in five minutes. But the company, Absolutely. I think, came out much stronger in, 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 in the mindset, in the thought yeah. processes that enable them to work. There's always this discussion of. Uh, Absolutely. Uh, so, government, uh, private sector, university systems. That was strengthened a little bit more, which which, pri- which previously had been one of Africa's weakest points, where the university doesn't speak very closely to the private sector or with the government. Now they're more in bed because they have to produce the vaccine and they have to educate kids and, and the whole continent with the green population and with their online tools that are coming from, from the private sector. So, uh, uh, I, I think uh, overall, the government came out very well. The government, um, uh, the public sector is a little bit more innovative, more open right. than before to working with, with, with the private sector. And the average citizen is more empowered to step out of the role. So. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Nkem. That was very fascinating. Um, you know, uh, like you said, you know, five minutes are not enough possibly to talk about a lot of these topics, but. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the format offers us that much. And uh, now I'm going to ask uh, Tris to wait on this. My request to Tris and Suman now is uh, we just have five minutes left on the session. So, uh, you know, my question to Tris is, you know, you're somebody who's steeped in, you know, uh, social innovation and what you do, because you uh, essentially you're f- identifying and, you know, rewarding and funding uh, people who are solving the world's problems innovatively. 
So uh, what do you see as the top, you know, you're probably the best person to ask this question to, but uh, your top two innovations, social innovations that you think the world badly needs in the wake of the pandemic? Yeah, I mean, I think the answer is we need to focus on areas that if like the market is not going to solve on its own. And we need to focus on areas where there is promising innovation happening at a local level and how we can scale it to have a much greater impact. And particularly with bearing in mind trends and forces and the storm that uh, Simone was talking about that, that, are, that, are, that, are, that, are, that we're in the midst of. So like examples of that that we're looking at at the moment would be, you know, we're, we're, the increasing numbers of migration, refugees, um, caused by all sorts of things, not least um, uh, things like uh, climate, climate change and, and so on, where people, a large numbers of people are living in semi-permanent refugee settings or even permanent refugee settings um, or, or camps. We need innovation that moves beyond just um, providing the people in those settings with, with their basic needs. You see, that's the first thing that's, that's, that's needed. To how do we enable people in those positions to um, have opportunities that um, are life enhancing and enable them to build and develop their lives, even though they're in the midst of um, terrible um, situations often. So how do you provide, for example, decent education to young people in those sorts of settings at scale? Um, another example perhaps would be around data. So there's an enormous proliferation of data-driven innovation in a whole variety of different settings. We need to bend the way that innovation evolves around data-driven innovation so that it is maximizing the opportunity for the many not being harnessed so much by a few that are then exploiting it. Because the, 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 the opportunity for data-driven innovation is to be truly transformative. And then finally, like the climate adaptation. There's a, there's a huge lack of innovation tackling some of the enormous issues that we're going to be facing. In order Absolutely. To Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Tristan. Sorry to rush you, but I just want to make sure Suman gets a minute or two to say his piece uh, because I'm going to throw an interesting question to him. So, Suman, you're the scaling expert. Uh, you know, you address a lot of companies on building companies to scale. So, how do you see Asia, you know, scaling social innovation? So, uh, we have been, we've been trying with this uh, model. Uh, which uh, I won't say that, and I can't count jury that has been working. So directly get into something very tactical. So for example, let's look at uh, Europe. Uh, uh, European Union has funded over the years, literally billions of uh, euros or pounds of taxpayers' money in doing innovation in various European universities. And these are patents which are literally lying dust, gathering dust. Uh, a lot of this innovation is is has been research done. Uh, given the sad state of uh, VC, you know, see Europe is a strange valley of death that happens for the VC. So it's good funding and the, and the seed, and then good funding for private equity. VC is just not there. Uh, you you take bring it to Asia, and you and you start partnering in Asian countries for markets which have evolved to a certain extent. It could be India. It could be. Uh, you know, Vietnam, etc. And then you apply into Africa. So, yep. So I think uh, there are models of intercontinental uh, accesses, leverage what is already there, fund from the, the various kinds of structures that are available, use Asia as a petri dish to grow the, uh, the, the experiment, and then Absolutely. apply as needed in Africa. Absolutely. Wonderful. That is very helpful uh, and very, very insightful. I think this has been a fascinating session and uh, I'm, I'm not surprised at all that despite not having two speakers, 
we still don't have enough time for everybody to say their piece, which which says a lot about how much one can talk about this topic and how relevant it is in today's times. I once again want to thank uh, each and every one of you for taking the time out to be on this panel. I have absolutely enjoyed sharing this discussion uh, and and uh, I look forward to you know doing more sessions with you hopefully in future. And thanks to everybody listening in. I uh, hope you found this useful. And thanks again to Frank and team on the harasser side. Okay. Have a great one. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye.